But anyway, Brother Getch, you come. Give us what God's laid on your heart. Pastor. All right. Well, good evening. Good evening. Trust you had a good day, beautiful day today. And uh, we enjoyed some good fellowship and uh, dinner over at uh, Chris and Christine's. And I sure appreciate uh, that. That was a lot of fun. And uh, it's been a good week. I'm glad my wife was able to make it back up, warmed up uh, a little bit. I sure appreciate your understanding with that. And um, a little cold the last couple of nights, but uh, much better today. And so I uh, brought, uh, brought the whole crew uh, tonight. And um, it's been good. And uh, it's hard to believe it's Thursday night already, though. Uh, pastor said the first day it was going to go by quick, but it really does go by uh, too quick sometimes. But uh, but tomorrow's the, save the best for last. Tomorrow's going to be great. It's going to be a lot of fun. I hope that uh, just because it's the ski rally, you think, oh, that's where all the teens will be packing the place. More the merrier. Come, come out, uh, really. You don't want to miss that. Uh, it, it, it'll just encourage you being around the young people and just uh, being around that and seeing a packed auditorium and all that. I, I can remember years past that just always bless in my heart to see that many young people willing to come out to a church show uh, activity and um, and uh, it's always been really easy to preach at the ski rally and just a good spirit and so uh, you won't want to miss you won't want to miss that so uh, uh, come on out join us and um, I was told tonight that some of the best uh, um, Hispanic food I've ever had is going to be tomorrow night so Mexican rice uh, I'm, I'm all in for that so uh, we'll uh, we'll be here and uh, looking looking forward to it would you take your Bibles and let's go to Luke chapter 4 tonight. Luke chapter 4. <clears throat> I'm sorry, not Luke chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4. Sorry. Dude, I was in Luke 4. You were in Luke 4 this morning. Well, that's because you're going to preach it next time you get opportunity. Um, Luke 4 is where I was today as well because I'm, I'm, I'm preaching through the book of Luke. So uh, I'm getting, thinking about Sunday already. But um, no, Revelation chapter 4. And... Um, this is, a, this is a wonderful passage of scripture. Revelation chapter 4, and um, I'm just going to kind of get us started here. I really am going to go through Revelation chapter 5 tonight and, um, and uh, kind of walk us through just a, a, little, uh, a little bit of Revelation chapter 5, the first part of it. The last part's kind of all about the same thing, so we'll kind of get to that point. But I want to kind of set that up at the end of Revelation chapter 4. And just start by reading 9 through 11. I think it really sets the stage for Revelation 5. And so uh, look if we, with me, if you would, Revelation 4 and verse number 9, when it says, And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne, and worship him that liveth forever and ever, and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. So Revelation chapter number 4 starts the revelation of this book. The first three chapters are the letters to the churches, and, and then when you come to chapter 4, um, John is caught up into heaven. And he is given this vision while on the Isle of Patmos to write before us so that we would have the revelation of God. Now you'll notice that it is revelation singular. It is not revelations. It's revelation because this is the revelation of God of Jesus Christ. And in this book, you will see Christ like no other book describes him. It's in this book that he is described as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Chapter 4 is all around the throne of God. In fact, some things are described there and it's really hard to even wrap our mind around because it's not of this earth. It is of heaven and, and of glory and it's of God and the throne of God. And, and then it ends here at the end that, that he is worthy and he is worthy of all praise and worthy of all worship for by him were all things created. And then it enters into chapter number 5. And really, chapter 4 just sets the stage then for chapter 5. We're still in heaven. We're still around the throne of God. And the Apostle John here is writing out this revelation that God is showing him. He's giving him a visual of uh, this, uh, this scene around the throne of God. Now remember, this scene is still to come. This scene has not happened yet. 
This has not occurred as of tonight. Uh, this is a scene that will happen. It will take place. And this revelation that God gives of a, is an event that is going to happen. And really, it is the event of all events. Because when it comes to revelation, the drama begins in chapter 5. And chapter 5, when I say drama, I mean drama. In fact, I, I think uh, it would be okay to say this tonight. This is the event of all events, Revelation chapter 5. Th this is what it's all been about. F from the beginning to the end, this, this, this chapter is the thrux of everything here in Revelation chapter 5. This would be the event of all events. I suppose you could say this would be the beginning of the end for the unbelieving that live on this earth. But it also is the beginning of eternity for all those that have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. This is, uh, this is the event of all events. I suppose we could say it's the beginning of the end on this earth as we know it tonight. So let's just walk through this event. And as you read it, remember, it's an event that is still to come. John is given a revelation of Christ, an event is still to come. And just walk through some of these verses and see this event and um, that's still to come. Look at verse number one of Revelation 5. It says, And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within on the backside sealed with seven seals. Okay, we're in heaven. We're around the throne of God. That's described in Revelation chapter 4, the throne of God. We then see the elders falling down, uh, the angels falling down. He is worthy of worship. And now while around this throne, we'll later learn in this passage of scripture that this is quite an event, uh, thousands upon thousands. In fact, it says thousands upon ten thousands upon thousands of angels uh, of, uh, of uh, church age saints. I mean, this is, a, this is a, a, an event of an event and it's all around the throne of God and all are looking to the throne of God and, 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 and they watch as they see in his right hand the hand of power. They see him sitting on his throne and he has a, a book in his hand. He's holding a book. Um, let's just remember, this wouldn't be a book like we know it. Um, this would, this would probably be a book that would look more like uh, in the times uh, of when Revelation was uh, recorded. Uh, John references it as a book, but the books back then would have been more in scrolls written on, on papyrus. And here he's got, this, he's got this scroll, he's got this book in his hand. And then it's described to us a little differently than maybe how we would describe a book. It says that it's written within and on the back side, and then it is sealed with seven seals. Now, the, the fact that it's written on the inside and on the back side is just speaking to the completion of this book. This book is a complete book. There is nothing to be added to this book, and there is nothing to be taken away from this book. It has been sealed with the seven, with the seven seals. Um, now, the way this book is described, it would, uh, it would uh, be likened unto legal documents in that day. Uh, you know, a Roman document would be sealed seven times. There'd be seven seals to any kind of Roman legal document, whether that document would be for marriage, whether that document would be for land or for purchase, uh, inheritance, uh, those types of things. Those legal documents would always be sealed with seven Roman seals. Uh, what would happen is, is the um, uh, all the details of that document would be on the inside. It then would be sealed, and it would have seven seals on it. And then on the back side of it would just have a summary of what that document entailed. Just a kind of a summary. That would be a Roman, uh, a Roman uh, a deed or a uh, um, or a, some side of a, a purchase of sale type of type of uh, document. Now, the Jewish documents were very similar. They weren't exactly like the Roman document, um, but they, they were somewhat similar in that they would take the document and they would write a portion of the deed or the document. They would then 
uh, folded. So they would write it out, then it would be folded, and then a witness would have to sign. Um, they would have to sign their name there. Then they would write some more, and they would fold it again, and another witness would sign. Um, a legal document in the Jewish culture had to have three witnesses, had to have three signatures. But the more important the document, the more signatures you would have, the more, the more folds you'd have. And then after it was uh, uh, signed uh, and uh, written completely, uh, then they would also put a little summary on it after it's sealed, after it would be sealed, closed. Um, the reason why I just... Uh, uh, think about uh, this book is that perhaps what we're looking at here in the hand of God is the deed or the title to the earth. Now it would not be the title for what is to be inherited, but rather it would be the title or the deed to saying how it's going to be inherited. Because as you know, with each breaking of the seal, the earth will be inherited by the righteous judgments of God being poured upon the earth. This is the beginning of God setting all things right on this earth. You know, there's a lot of things not right tonight. Yeah. <laughs> there's a lot of things that are a mess tonight. Right. We live in a broken world. We live in a post-fall society. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of wrongs uh, in this in this world. But make no mistake, one day, God's going to set it all straight. Yes. He's going to make the crooked straight again. Yeah. He's going to heal the broken. He's going to make it right. That's this event. He is going to inherit the earth and now is going to inherit it through the righteous judgments, uh, the righteous judgments of God. So he has this book. It's been sealed with these seals. He's holding this title deed of the earth, okay? Um, but there's one thing about a title deed. Not just anybody can open those things. Only the heir, only the rightful owner can break those seals. It's unlawful for anyone else to break the seals to that document. So that brings us to verse number two. It says, and I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. So now we need someone to open this book. We need someone who is, um, is able, someone who is qualified, and someone who is willing, right? So we need an heir to be able to open this book, this title deed of the earth, to inherit it back. We need someone who is qualified, we need someone who is willing, and we need someone who is able to take that book and break open those seals. Look at verse number, verse number three. He says there, and no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look upon, thereupon. Okay, so a strong angel comes and starts shouting, who is worthy? To open the book, who is qualified, who is able, who is willing to open the book? Remember, this is an event of all events. There is thousands upon ten thousands around this throne. And so they begin to go out looking for that heir. Now look where they look. They looked in all of heaven. Now, I don't know about you, but I start thinking about who's in this crowd. This is quite a crowd. Right? When you start thinking about who's, um, who would be in this crowd from uh, Old Testament saints, church age saints, the angels of the Lord, this is quite a crowd, but there's no one in heaven worthy. So then it says that they, um, they went on to look where? Under the earth. They, they, they went to hell. They went to under the earth. Nope. Nobody qualified there, right? Then they went to um, earth itself, those that are still on the earth, but there's no one qualified there. So the reports start coming back in, right? They're looking for this heir, but no one, no one, no one is able, no one is worthy, nobody is willing to take the book 
and break open those seals. So that brings us then to verse number four. It says, and I, that's John, he's the one that's seeing this vision. He is in this place watching this event as God is going to inspire him to record it for us of event to come. And it says, and I wept much. Now, before we just skip over that line, I want you to see the emphasis of the word much. I wept much. Um, it's the same word wept that is used of Jesus Christ in Luke 19 when it says that he was come near and he beheld the city and he wept over it. It's the same wept that is used in Luke 22 verses 61 and 62 after Peter denied the Lord for the third time and the cock crew and the Bible says that Peter went out and wept bitterly. Uh, it is the strongest word to describe a weeping that is uncontrollable. In other words, he has fallen into an uncontrollable state of just weeping and wailing. Now, I don't know what that leads you to ask, but the question it asks leads me to ask is why? Why has this led him to weep so much? I mean, I thought there was no crying in heaven, right? And yet he is weeping uncontrollably here. He says, I wept much. And then it says, why? Look what it says there. It says, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. So the fact that all the reports have come back and there was no man worthy found has left him in an uncontrollable weeping condition. Remember, he is watching a vision of an event to come. Jesus is, is showing him this vision. God has given him this vision. He is looking at this of an event to come. And when he gets to this place, he just loses it. He's uncontrollable. Why? Well, because there's no one to take the book. You know, that tells me that there's something really important about this book. There is something really, really significant about someone taking this book and opening those seals. I think to fully maybe, or to understand a little better, might need a little perspective from um, other parts of Scripture. Because really, Scripture has been pointing to this event from the very beginning. And time and time again, we see the scripture talking about this event. One such book is a little jewel that I refer to it as the book of Ruth. Now what's interesting about the book of Ruth that I learned here rather recently, um, my wife was uh, doing some study and, and uh, she uh, came across some study about the Jewish Bible. And, uh, and we started looking into the, the different order that they have in the Jewish Bible. I think I mentioned it or referenced that the last book is Second Chronicles, I found that interesting. But you know what's interesting about the book of Ruth in the Jewish Bible? We have it categorized as a history book. So it's a book that's just giving us a history, something that occurred. And certainly there is history. I mean, this did occur. I mean, it's a real event between Ruth and Boaz and, and, uh, and uh, this uh, family uh, that went to Moab. And, and so this is, this is history. But you know the Jewish Bible puts Ruth in the prophecy section? It's a prophecy book. What's it prophesying? What's, what's it showing? Well, I'm going to tell you, among other things, it's Revelation chapter 5. So well, what's about Ruth that points to Revelation chapter number 5? Well, I'm not going to take you to read all of Ruth. It, I, I, if you've never studied the book of Ruth, I would wholeheartedly encourage you to go to the book of Ruth and just do a study in the book of Ruth. It'll uh, bless your heart. But, but um, it's the time of the judges. And during the time of the judges, a great famine had come upon Israel. And so during the time of the judges, Elimelech, a man there in Israel, and his wife Naomi, and their two sons made a decision. And really, it's quite a decision. Um, and that was to sell what they had in Israel, sell their property in Israel, and to take his family to Moab. Uh, that was no light decision. I mean, that's a, that was a serious decision. I mean, the Moabites, Moab. Um, but they had food. 
He's got a family that's starving. There is no food in Israel. And so he makes a decision to sell uh, his property, and he moves his two sons and wife, Naomi, to Moab. While in Moab, his two sons meet two Moabite women, and they marry him. They marry these two Moabites. And, um, but then uh, the men all die in Moab. Elimelech dies, and also his two sons died. And both of the sons died before they had any children. So there were no children. There were no sons to carry on Elimelech's name. There were no heirs then. Um, in this culture, a woman could not be an heir. And so the fact that there was no sons, there means there was no, there was no heir. And so you have Naomi and her two daughters. But these young ladies are young enough, don't have any children. She encourages them to go back to their families in Moab. There's still a chance for them to remarry. That's the only chance for them other than destitution, homelessness, because a woman can't work. A woman can't make a living. Um, and not to have an heir, someone to take care of you. Boy, that, that's just... So there's still a chance. They could go back to their families, and then they could marry again someone through the Moabite family and, and have, have a life. Go forth. So she, she tells them to go home. And one of the uh, darn laws does that. But then there's that statement from Ruth that we've all come to love is... Ruth responds to her mother-in-law, Naomi, and says in verse 16, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go, and where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. Where thou diest, I will die, and, uh, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught, but death part thee and me. And so she makes... She makes a commitment to Naomi. And so the two women go back to Israel. Because in Israel, there was a chance for them to survive. And Naomi would have known of this um, chance. And that was there was a provision in the law that for the widows, that the, the um, harvesters, after harvesting a field, was to leave some in the field so that the widows could come and gather and have food to eat. And so knowing of this provision in the law, Naomi takes Ruth back to Israel and she sends Ruth into a man's name, uh, Boaz's uh, field, and uh, to, to glean. Lead, to, you know, he's going to leave some, that was by law, and uh, she could gather and uh, take it back and they could at least have something, uh, something to, uh, to eat. And of course, you know, um, Ruth caught Boaz's eye, right? And back, Boaz tells his, um, his reapers, or he, sa he says, hey, leave some extra for, Bo for, for Ruth, right? Boaz said, hey, you leave some extra for Ruth. She caught his eye. And so Ruth, you know, wow, I don't know why I have this favor found. I don't know why, but she goes back and she tells Naomi that the, the kindness of Boaz, and he has left extra for them. And all of a sudden, Naomi would have known something. Boaz would have known it too, but he could not bring up the topic. But Naomi would have known that there is provision within the law of Israel for them to be redeemed. See, um, they sold their land. Elimelech would have sold their land. With the men dying, their line ended. So no hope. But they could be redeemed by a kinsman redeemer, um, an heir could purchase the land back for them. Uh, you see, when you sell land in Israel, you always remember that it wasn't your land to sell. The land of Israel belongs to God. Now, he then would give it to Israel, be divided up by tribe, and families were given land, and it was theirs, but, um, but it, was, it was still God's land. In other words, you could sell your land. If you got in, got in a bad shape and you were poor and you needed money, you could sell your land. But eventually... Uh, that land would come back to the family. In fact, every 49 years, it would, the land would always revert back to the family that God had given it, or the line, or the heir that God had given it. Another reason why those genealogies were quite important. The year of Jubilee, the land would revert, revert back. But even before the 50th year, there was the provision of law that an heir, nearest heir to uh, to family, could purchase when that's not possible, there was another um, provision in the law called the Leverite marriage. 
The Leverite marriage said if there was someone who was able, someone who was worthy, and someone who was willing, they could, um, they could marry uh, the widow as long as the widow had no sons. They would then make the commitment of raising sons in the name of the dead husband and would redeem that family line or redeem that, that, that land to its original family. Um, Naomi would have known of this. So when she hears that Boaz has caught, Ruth has caught Boaz's eye, she tells Ruth all this. And she says, Ruth, you go to Boaz. Here's what you say. Here's what you do. Because within this, Boaz could not bring this subject up. That was part of the law. The widow had to ask the man. The man could not ask the widow. So she would have to go, and she would have to ask him to redeem her, to redeem the line. And of course, that brings us to the great threshing floor scene, you know, of Ruth and Boaz, when she then, of course, doesn't know any of this except for through Naomi. And Naomi has told her what to say. Boaz would have known it, but he couldn't bring up that. No matter how much he loved Ruth, no matter how much he maybe even was willing to, he could not unless she would bring it up. The ball was in the widow's court. And so she then asked Boaz, and of course, we learn that he was able. He, um, he uh, certainly uh, was worthy, and, um, yeah, and he was also most willing. And so he becomes the kinsman redeemer to the Elimelech line and marries uh, Ruth and agrees to raise sons in that, in that line. Okay, so it's this beautiful book. Well, what's it got to do with Revelation chapter number 5? Well, if there's no one to be a kinsman redeemer, if there's no one that's willing, and there's no one that's able, and there's no one that's worthy, then Naomi and Ruth's future is nothing but destitution. There's no hope. So the kinsman redeemer redeeming Ruth, and Ruth really is a, a picture of the Gentile bride. Naomi is a picture of Israel. Boaz is a picture of Christ. And you see that Ruth only learns about the law through Naomi. Naomi only learns about Boaz through Ruth. And once again, she had to ask him. He couldn't redeem her unless she would be the one to ask. So in Revelation, if there is not one worthy to open the book, if there is not a willing, able, and worthy heir to open the book, it means that the earth and its inhabitants go unredeemed. Meaning they are destined to an eternity of damnation. There is no hope except for a worthy, able, and willing heir. And so when there's no man found, John loses it. He begins to weep bitterly. So that brings us to verse number five. Stay with me. It's going to get really good here. Verse five says, and one of the elders. Now the word elders, there is a church age uh, uh, term. It's only used in references to the church. So a church age saint here, an elder uh, from uh, uh, the church here, uh, leans over. An elder then leans over and saith to me, says to John, weep not. So in other words, this elder leans over and says, why are you weeping? Stop crying. And I'm sure John says, what do you mean? Don't you know what's going on here? If there's no one that's able to take that book, if there's no one that's worthy and able, we're, we're, we're done. We're most men miserable. And the elder looks at him and says there, look at verse number five, says, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prepared or prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. So the elder points John 
to two Old Testament titles that were given to Jesus Christ. The Lion of Judah and the Root of David. The Lion of Judah is talked about in Genesis 49. 8 through 10 and speaks of the Redeemer being the Lion of Judah. Uh, the uh, the uh, root of David uh, is described and prophesied of Isaiah 11, 1 and 2. The one who will reign on the throne, a kingdom that will go for all of eternity, will be from the root of David, the Messiah, the Redeemer. He is going to be from the root of David. And so the elder, he leans over and says, hey, stop weeping. There's the Lion of Judah. There is the root of David. And then I love what he says. He says there at the end, hath prevailed to open the book. Notice that's past tense. That's past tense. He's not now prevailing. No, no. He hath pre prevailed. Long before he takes the book and opens it, he has already prevailed. You know where he prevailed at? It is finished. He became the rightful heir. He, he, he became worthy. He's the redeemer. Redemption is finished. And so the elder says, remember the line of Judah? Remember the root of David? I'm sure John begins to look more intently because then it leads to verse number six. It says, and behold, or behold, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth unto the earth. And so he begins to watch the throne of God. And all of a sudden, in the midst of the throne, stands the lamb. And notice that it says, the lamb as he had been slain. Now the lamb is a title, um, a very important title, right? Given to Jesus Christ. But you know, the name lamb actually is um, only used in the Old Testament twice. The title lamb in the Gospels is only used twice. Um, in the book of Acts, um, it's used once. And in, in all of the epistles, the title is only used once. But in Revelation, the title of lamb is used 28 times. The lamb. See, the only reason he's the Lion of Judah is because he first became the Lamb. And he went to that cross. And he took upon the sins of all mankind. Your sins. My sins. And he bore them there. He took our penalty for sin. And he bore it on his own back. He became the Redeemer. And all those that would come to him and ask for redemption, all those that would come to him and put their trust in him, be redeemed. Because he became the Lamb. As he was slain. You know there's only one man-made thing in heaven? And that's the wounds of Jesus. So just picture this scene, and I'll start to wrap this up. Picture this scene if you can. Here's John. He's taken into this event of all events. I mean, he is put into this mass of thousands upon thousands upon thousands of angelic hosts and, and Old Testament saints and, and, and church age believers, and, and here they all are, right? And there's the throne of God, and we're looking at the throne of God himself. And then all of a sudden, God is holding this book in his right hand. This angel goes forth and begins to proclaim, Who is worthy? And man, there becomes a scurry, and everyone's looking about. They look all over heaven. They look under the earth. They look in the earth. And the reports start coming back. Oh, man. No man. John begins to panic. If there's not an heir, there's no hope. He begins to weep. But then that 
elder leans over and says, hey, don't forget about the Lion of Judah. Don't forget about the Root of David. John then looks again to the throne of God, and there at the right hand, in the midst of the throne, stands the Lamb. Has he been slain? The Lamb. Wow. And the Bible says in verse number 7, he takes the book. Why? Because he's worthy. He's able, and he is willing. He is the rightful heir. And he takes the book, and he begins to open the seals. Really, the book of Revelation is one event. Centered around the throne, Jesus taking that book, and he begins to open the seals one at a time, and he reads the contents therein. And as he reads, it takes place upon the earth. And he begins to inherit the earth back through the righteous judgments of God. He begins to set it all straight. Make it all right. The Lamb takes the book. And then when you look at verse number 8, chapter 5, down to the end of the chapter, it really just speaks of a crescendo of praise. I mean, song breaks out. I mean, choir. There's a redeemer. There is one worthy. And all of a sudden they see the lamb stand and take that book. And I mean, it begins to be this choir of worship and praise and adoration. And just look at the crescendo as it leads there uh, through there in verse number one. Verse number 8, it says, And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, and having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. And then they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and has redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred, every tongue, every people, every nation, and has made us unto God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. This is the song. This is what they're singing. That, that's a hymn right there. And I mean, they begin to sing and worship. We have been redeemed, and we've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, the one who went to that cross and was slain for us. He's the rightful heir, and now we're going to reign with him. He is king. He is ruler. He is Lord of lords. He is king of kings. And it just builds and it builds as he opens that seal. <laughs> wow. This is the event. This is the event of all events. And to think about it tonight, I'm going to be there Amen. I'm going to be there. I'm going to see that. Amen. I'm going to be in that choir. I don't get invited to sing in too many choirs down here, but I'm going to be in that one. I'm going to be in that choir. I'm going to watch my Savior stand and take that book. I'm going to see him set it all straight, make it all right. He's already prevailed. He's already had the victory. He is King of kings, and He is Lord of lords. And in that day, all will recognize Him as such. The Bible tells us that every knee is going to bow, and every tongue is going to confess that He is the Lord. Amen. I love what Job says in Job 19.25. He says, I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that He shall stand in the latter day upon the earth. Job, recognized as being the oldest book in our Bibles, probably lived around yeah, somewhere in the same time period maybe as Abraham. And he says, I know that, watch this, my Redeemer liveth. And in the latter day, what day is that? That's Revelation. That's this day. In the latter day, he's coming back. And he's going to stand on this, on this earth. He's going to sit on that throne. And we're going to be ruling with him. 
You know, in that day, everyone's going to see him as the redeemer. The question is, is he your redeemer? He is the redeemer. There's no question about that. And in that day, everyone's going to see him as king of kings and lord of lords. And that he's the redeemer. The question will be, is he your redeemer? Or is he the redeemer? Once again, he does not come to you. He's made himself available. He's already prevailed. Whosoever will may come. Have you gone to him and recognized him as the redeemer you need for your sin and called on him to save you? If so, then he is your redeemer. And your savior one day is going to stand on this earth. This event we are going to see. And they just sing, he is worthy. He is worthy. But I got to tell you, he is not just worthy when we get there. He's just as worthy tonight. He's worthy of your life. He's worthy of your praise. He's worthy of your worship. He's worthy of your days. He is worthy. Don't wait till Revelation 5. We can start worshiping him, praising him, serving him, living for him right now today. Amen. Why? Because I know that my Redeemer liveth. And on this earth, he will again stand. I don't know if you know that hymn or not, but I was thinking about that hymn. In fact, I printed out, it's not in every hymn book. And I don't know if it's in your hymn book or not. Maybe someone can look that up. But I want you just to think about these words. And if you know it, just jump in and sing along as we close tonight. I know that my Redeemer liveth and on the earth again shall stand I know eternal life he giveth that grace and power are in his hand I know I know that Jesus liveth and on the earth again shall stand I know I know that life he giveth and grace and power are in his hand. I know. Amen. Do you know? He's coming again. Amen. It's all going to be made right. He's worthy. Let's live for him now. Let's serve him now. And we can do so confidently. Because he's prevailed. Lord, thank you so much for the opportunity tonight. Lord, and I have not even begun to make or do justice to this passage of Scripture. Just scratching the surface, really. But I pray, Lord, that tonight we've seen you as you have declared yourself here in these verses. As the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Redeemer, the rightful heir, the Lamb. The Lamb, and because you're the Lamb, you are the Lion of Judah, and one day will come and set all things right and rule and reign. And Lord, I pray that tonight we would see you for who you are, that we would magnify in our hearts, that we would see you as worthy. And as the elders just cast down before you, fall down before you, Lord, I pray that our hearts would be humbled before you, and that we would live our days on this earth for you, for your glory, serving you, and doing so with great confidence and joy, knowing my Redeemer liveth. He's coming again. He's going to set it all right. And then, Lord, if there be one in this auditorium tonight that doesn't know if you are their Redeemer, they've never come to you, and by faith look to you and trusted in you and you alone to save them. Oh Lord, would they see you for who you are as the Lamb, the Redeemer? 
and if they would just come to you and call upon you, the Bible says, thou shalt be saved. And I pray that tonight would be the night of salvation. You would become their redeemer tonight. Pray that you just bless the closing of our time and lead pastor as he comes and leads it. The piano will just begin to play and as we've done each night, just give some time, perhaps just to praise him tonight, maybe just to worship him tonight. Maybe tonight just be reminded of how worthy he is of my days, my life. But maybe tonight, you're not sure if he's your redeemer. Oh, I tell you, he is the redeemer. Wouldn't you make him your redeemer tonight? Would you call upon him to save you, give you everlasting life? If there's doubt in your heart about your salvation tonight. I encourage you to get those questions answered tonight. The Word of God answers those questions, and we'd be delighted to point you to those answers tonight if that's the need of your heart. But we'll just take a few more moments, then, Pastor. We'll come.